Amen. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, you are wonderful in all that you do. Where would we be without your mercy? There is none like unto you, Lord, and we glorify you this morning. We praise your name. Lord, I pray that you bless all that occurs this morning. Be glorified in our midst. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I pray that you minister to your people this morning. In your name, Lord. Amen. Welcome. Good to see you here. God bless you, each one. Uh, just, uh, I want to just point out one thing. We are going to have a special uh, business meeting after church this morning. It's not going to take long, maybe ten minutes. And so, if you're a member and you're, uh, if you're a member and you're willing to hang out, lunch won't be very much later than it, than it would be otherwise. Ten minutes, and, but it's very important that we discuss this this morning. So we want to remind you that hang out. You may give you five minutes to go to the rest of the meeting. And other than that, we will not stay long to start or to finish. And so God bless you. Let's sing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
In the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, we read, He who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract him, us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. We enjoy verses 4 and 5. Surely he took up our pain, bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. The blessing, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, wounds we are healed. Praise God. But we tend to pass over his suffering, his pain, and his we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. My focus for you this morning, though, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears was silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he, is, he was taken away. Yet, 
who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a, ga- a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in him. We're singing the song of I surrender all. It was the Lord's will that this would happen to him, and he willingly surrendered. He willingly surrendered himself, his life, his body, so that you and I can have salvation, so we can have redemption, so that you and I can be healed. The blessings of God are ours because he was willing to surrender and to lay down his life for you and I. Can we sing the chorus to that, please? We should. We should likewise surrender ourselves to Him. Probably not to death on the cross. But to surrender to Him whatever His will would dictate to our lives. I would encourage you to make that commitment to Him today. Just the chorus, Teresa. Partake of the elements today. Consider this like a lamb led to the slaughter. In silence. If, they, if I knew that they were going to do that to me, I'd be kicking in the tree. You're the same. But not our Lord. He willingly surrendered to the will of God for him. Beseech me, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice. In other words, surrender. Surrender to him.
thank you, Lord Jesus, that you allowed your body to be broken and your blood to be shed for us. Thank you that you willingly submitted to the will of the Father. You humbled yourself. I pray, Lord, that we would also humble ourselves before you. And would surrender ourselves to you and to your will. Not just in some areas, but in every area of our life. For Lord, you are the king. And you're either the king of everything or the king of nothing. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had blessed it, he said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Remember me as often as you eat it. Bell, would you bless this uh, this, uh, bread, please? Shall we partake of the bread together? After supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant that is shed for you. For you. Remember me as often as you drink it. Eric, will you bless this cup, please? Shall we partake of the cup together? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes.
dreams, our goals, our successes, our failures. Pray that we would surrender ourselves to you. So that we may worship you and serve you with our whole heart. We glorify you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence in this place. Thank you for your love and for your faithfulness. Lord, we pray for Don this morning, Lord, that you would touch him. And as he's been taken to the hospital, I would pray that your hand would be on him and that you would heal his body and lift him up. I pray. I pray, Lord, for this family that has lost their home. I just pray that you would touch them and encourage them and provide for them. I pray for those who are sick, Lord. I pray for Tom, that you would minister to him. I pray for John, that you minister to him. Lord, I just pray that you be glorified by their healing. Lift each one of them up. Lord, I pray for the rest of this service that you would be that you would be merciful and gracious, and that your blessing would rest on us. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Would you like to shake hands with a few? Bless them in the name of the Lord. Children may be dismissed to go to children's church.
God's good, isn't He? Amen. Yes, He is all the time. Amen. From there? That's a good word. I encourage you to apply that to your heart, not just in church, but in every day as you come to Him in worship, as you come to Him in your devotion, running for God, expressing your love for Him. Very, very important. Dale, can you come? Who's your partner this morning? Miley? Jesus, I just thank you this morning for your grace. Lord, I thank you that you have loved us, cared for us. I pray that you would bless this offering, Lord. I pray that you would be glorified and that you would cause us to be cheerful givers to you, Lord. In your blessed and precious name. Amen. We're going to have a baptismal service on Sunday morning the 25th. If you are wanting to be baptized in water, you come talk to me. And we would we can make that happen. That's the morning of, the, of June 25th. If you would like to turn to the book of Job, Job chapter 2. Get your mind right. Have you, have you ever started getting notions or thoughts or ideas that just aren't true? Come on now. At times, Jennifer has to say to me, you know, you need to start talking truth to yourself. Or you're going to end up out in left field. Sometimes God gets to it before Jennifer does. And God says, you need to start thinking right thoughts. Or you're going to end up in right field, left field, out in the bushes. Such is the case in Job chapter 2. We're going to read verses 7 to 10. So, you know the story of Job. Job was the richest man in the land at that time. He had ten sons. 
He was rich. He had he had cattle. He had uh, he was rich. He was righteous. There was no fault in him. But Satan had come to God and said, "The reason God served you faithfully is because you don't let me touch him." So one by one, God allowed Satan to afflict and to take all these things from Job. So in verse 7, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Ouch! Can you imagine that kind of pain? Have you ever had sores on the bottoms of your feet? Ooh, howdy, that hurt. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. He'd lost everything. Everything. His, his, his kids had died. Still had one. His house was gone. His cattle was gone. All of his servants were gone. All he had was this Pottery. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and then die. Oh. Now that's not a good thought. That is, just in case you're wondering, that's not a good thought. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Lord Jesus, I just thank you this morning for your word. I thank you that you have loved us. I just pray that you would bless this time. Teach us this morning of you and of your ways. And I just pray that you would be glorified. Open our hearts and our ears that we might hear from you this morning. In your blessed name. Amen. The wife of Job. <laughs> what a lady. Married to the richest man in the land at that time. Married to a good man. A righteous man. A godly man. However, we don't even know her name. We don't even know her name. Though she apparently had been a good wife, she had given him ten sons plus daughters. Wow. She had apparently been a good mother because they were a close-knit family. They had been raised well. And the mother has much to do with how the children are raised. But she goes down in history, much maligned. She goes down in history as foolish, although you notice that Job doesn't call her foolish. He's a smart man. Never call your wife foolish. (laughs) Not if you're smart. Don't call her foolish, but you're talking like a foolish. What you're saying is foolish. Don't tell people they're foolish, but maybe they're acting foolish, or they're talking foolishly. Let's not judge her too harshly. She is known as saying to her husband, curse God and die. What a harsh thing to say. What a foolish thing to say. Hopefully that has never passed your lips. What she said was foolish. We can't defend that. But I do acknowledge that she had watched, give her a break, because she had watched the suffering of of Job. She also had lost her children. She lost her children, too. She was desolate as well. Her house had burnt down, too. She had endured trial along with her husband. 
he had suffered as well. You know what? This is a statement of a very distressed, depressed person. A statement of a person ready to quit. Maybe you've been there where you're ready to quit. Why not? But I encourage you, don't quit. Because God's still on the throne. God is able. God will deliver. God will supply. Perhaps you have been discouraged. Perhaps you have endured great suffering. Have you ever wanted to quit? I believe said many of you have. This is where this lady found herself. This is how she felt. And she had made a honest an honest expression. It's how she felt. Is it foolish? Yes. Is it inaccurate? Yes. Is there another way to go? Yes. However, Job is a good husband in that he responds to her not in a Rebuke, not in a, oh, you're just stupid. He didn't call her foolish. He did not challenge her. He did not condemn her. You know what? He understood as well because he had suffered along with her. He knew that she was hurting. He had empathy with her. He knew her emotions because he most likely had many of the same emotions. He knew her pain. His answer was simply, you speak like a foolish woman. In other words, you need to get your mind right. Start thinking good thoughts. Your thinking is not accurate. He didn't attack her. He corrected her. Instead of, instead of condemning her, he corrected her. Now, there are three, there's lots of notions that are inaccurate that we can speak of. I have chosen three notions that we can get in our mind that aren't right. For instance, the first one, it is, it is not right to claim any excuse for not being faithful to God. It's not thinking right to say, you know what? I've had enough. I'm walking away from Him. It's never, never justified to walk away from God because God is faithful. And He has been faithful to you. Job, Job's wife asked, Do you still hold to your integrity? In other words, after all the pain, do you still have faith? How much pain can you endure until you no longer have faith? Oh boy. After all the loss, do you still trust God? After all the suffering, do you still believe God is God? After all the destructions, do you destruction, do you still know him? Why well, yes, you know him. Yes, you know his blessings and his power. You know his peace and his joy in your life. Job's wife asked him, after all that has happened, do you still serve God? She thought Job had a good reason to rebel, and the answer is no. Job still did not have a good reason to rebel. Job still did not have a good reason to rebel. After all, they had lost their children, they had lost their riches, they had lost his, he had lost his health. What else is there? What else compares? You know what else compares? Our relationship with him. Do you serve him because of what he can give you? Or from what he does give you? Or do we serve Him because He's God? 
Well, hopefully you will respond, you serve him because, you're, because he's God. He is Almighty God and there is no other. We serve him because of who he is, not because of what he gives us. He is God. God proved that He did not serve God for gain. And neither should we. We serve God because of who God is. He proved that God is greater than the riches that God had blessed. He was the richest man in the world, or in the land at that time. Take all that away and God still God. He had had all those children, but God is greater than those children. What is there in your life that is greater than God? So determine in your life, you are going to serve Him, surrender to Him, live for Him regardless. He's greater than that house you live in. Even if your house burns down, God is still God. God's not going to stop being God. He's greater than your health. In all these things, God is greater. So focus your eyes on Him. Remember that old song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus? Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. If that house is greater than your relationship with God, perhaps... Just perhaps your eyes, your eyes or your attention is on something other than Him. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. We do not, we do not serve God for what we can get from God. Do not serve God because of what you can get from Him. Serve God because He's God. So whatever your pain, whatever your suffering, whatever your loss, whatever your trial, accept that God is greater than that. God is greater than those. God is still God. Accept that God sacrificed far more on Calvary for us than we could possibly imagine. And He deserves all of our attention, all of our loyalty, all of our love, Also, accept that because God is God and God is all powerful, that in all these things God is able to deliver, God is able to heal, God is able to solve the situation, but it's only as we keep our attention on our sin. The second foolish notion, get your mind right is that God has that idea that God has no future or further use for us. That notion that God has nothing else for you to do. That thought that I'm done. That's not a right thought. It's a lie from Satan that he whispers in our ears to convince us not to be about the Master's business. God does have a purpose for you. Every one of you. He's not done with you. He is not done with you. That thought of, well, I could no longer be useful, or woe is me, I can't do anything, or woe is me, the call to end it all. The feeling that What's the work? What's the use? He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Walk in that. Walk in that. You say, well, I'm not physically able to do a lot of these things. No, but you have the wisdom that you can share with others that do. You can partner with those who do. And as a church, we can accomplish much. God is not done with you until He calls you home to be with Him. He always has a plan. He always has a purpose for you. 
Know this today. God wants to use you for His glory. Perhaps you think, well, I'm just too tired. Well, then ask God for strength. Then work for His glory. I knew a lady that had advanced COPD. She couldn't go much more than about 15 steps. And she wanted to go out visiting, but she couldn't because she didn't have the strength to get into people's houses. She wanted to go knock on doors and invite people to church, but she, she, couldn't, she couldn't go and knock on doors. She wanted to do a lot of things, but she couldn't do it. So she did what she could. She prayed. She had an incredible prayer ministry because she was limited in all the other things. And she prayed and prayed and prayed that God would heal her body so she could do those things. You know what? God chose not to do that. And she wondered why God would not heal her of the COPD, heal her lungs so she could go do those things. God whispered in her ear because if I heal you, you wouldn't do what I have put the spirit to do. Because of your limitations and your weakness, you are strong. And the greatest ministry you can do for me is to pray. That was God's purpose for her. So what's God's purpose for you? Ask Him. Seek Him. He has a plan. Seek Him in that. Perhaps you think that you're too old. Well, Moses led Israel for 40 years out of Egypt. They wandered in the desert for another 40 years. He started at the age of 80. He finished at 120. God's purpose for him. Do you think you're going to wander around out in the desert leading a bunch of rebellious people until you're 120? Oh, Lord. That, that, that would be true. But if that's God's plan, if that's His purpose, He'll give you the strength, the endurance, to do that. Perhaps you're shy. Perhaps you're shy. I say you rely on the Holy Spirit who is able to give you boldness and power and strength. Allow Him to empower you and to work in you to be the witness He wants you to be. Because in reality, it's not you witnessing, it's Him witnessing through you. Allow yourself to be used by Him. So even shyness is not an excuse. It is a foolish notion, it's a wrong notion, to think that God is done with you. But God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for me. It's foolish to think that you are no longer useful to Him. For God has a plan for you. In fact, He straight out says, I have a plan for you. I know my plan for you. Walk in there. And it doesn't have a time limit. It's not as though He says, well, you know, that's expired. That's expired. No, God doesn't expire. With God, all things are possible. So don't think that you're not adequate. Yes, in yourself you are in- inadequate. This says, I am inadequate in and of myself. Oh, but with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Praise God. So don't allow Satan to feed that to you, that you're not good enough, or that you don't have any purpose, or that God is done with you. God does have a plan for you. So get your mind right. Start start speaking truth to yourself. Or better yet, allow the Holy Spirit to speak truth to you. The third foolish or the wrong notion that we need to forget 
is to forget the goodness of God. Remember the goodness of God. The blessings of God in your life. Sometimes we get into a situation and we feel like things are a little haywire. Actually, sometimes things are haywire. And then it takes up an attitude of, well, I don't care what God has done for me. You know, what I care about is what God's done for me lately. Do not forget the goodness of God in your life. And as God has done it before, God will do it again. Well, I'm sick. God healed you before, and God will heal you again. For God is faithful, and God is powerful, and God is able. Trust in Him. In verse 10 of Job 2, Job basically tells his wife, we must accept the pain along with the pleasure. Jesus said, don't you know it will rain on the just and the wicked? Don't you know the rain falls on all? That in your life you will have trouble, but in your life you'll also have blessings? How can you accept the blessings of God without accepting the adversity? We must accept the suffering along with our Savior. Accept the rain along with the sunshine. Why do I ever want it to rain? I don't, I, you know what, I lived in the, in the desert and it never rained. You know what, no, no rain rains? <laughs> it rains the desert. It rained about an inch and a half a year and there was no grass, no, no, nothing. It was just dirt, well, not even dirt, it was sand. God knows what He's doing. We must accept the trial as God's way to grow us so that we can become mature in Him. God has a purpose for all these things. We must accept the storm along with the peace that follows the storm. For no pain we endure compares with the goodness of God. No pain you endure compares with the goodness of God in your life. God is great and greatly to be praised. Consider how good God has been. Consider the blessings of God in your life. Consider the mercies that God has showered on you. How He has loved you, provided for you. Even in the midst of the storm, He endures with me. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. The goodness of God. The grace of God. The salvation of God in our lives. Consider the love of God that has been showered on you. What can you endure that compares to that? Even if you're sitting on ashes, scraping your shores, remember the goodness of God. Consider the promises of God. He does promise to deliver, to save, to provide, and He will do so. So this morning, you know, I would simply say to you that if you're suffering, if you are in adversity, if you're sick, I would encourage you to turn away from your eyes upon Jesus. The fall in His wonder. And the things of will grow strangely in the light 
that we would all fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, I pray that you would give endurance and strength in time of trouble. I pray that you give healing and strength in time of weakness. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would endure well. Remembering the suffering that you endured for our sake. Teach us, Lord, to walk with you. Teach us, Lord, to walk with you on every occasion. Remember that, remembering that in all things you are God.
Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would give us endurance for life's circumstances. I pray that in all things we would surrender ourselves before you. I thank you that you are God and that you're good and that you're gracious and merciful. And I thank you that we can be victorious in you regardless of life's circumstances. Cause us to give you thanks for who you are. pray that you dismiss us in your grace and in your mercy. I pray that we would glorify you, for you have loved us in your precious name, Lord. Amen. So if you'd like to take four or five minutes, go to the restroom, get a drink, and then come right back, and we'll have a short meeting.